Uh, good afternoon to everyone who's uh, joined us so far. Thank you for joining us for our um, one of our first annals webinars, as far as as far as I know. Uh, we're joined by Rachel, the uh, I say new chief editor. How long have you How long have you been in the position for now? Uh, since November. Since November. Oh, so new-ish. Oh, Time wow. doesn't exist at the moment, so <laughs> could be six months could be a year. But we uh, we welcome Rachel um, to do uh, an introduction to the annals and to introduce kind of what it is, what it does for BOHS, the importance of it, and most importantly, how to get involved with it uh, moving forward. So um, I don't know if you've been on a Teams webinar before, but for those of you who haven't, you've got a chat function at the top, a little speech bubble, um, if you want to ask anything while the webinar is ongoing. And then there's a raise hand function um, for the Q&A section, which we'll host at the end if you do have any questions, and then we can allow you to unmute yourself and, and chat with Rachel directly and, um, and ask your question. So that's pretty much everything for me introductory wise. So I will pass you over to Rachel to begin and we hope you enjoy the webinar. Great, thank you for the introduction, Lee. Um, as Lee mentioned, I'm the chief editor of the Annals of Work Exposure and Health and I'm also an associate professor at the University of Utah School of Medicine. And today I wanted to give an overview of kind of how the Annals works and what we, what we do and to try to get a little bit more involvement and engagement between BOHS and the annals, because the annals exist in part to serve uh, the BOHS membership. So the objectives today are to explain the scope of the annals and the role of the editorial board, explain the article submission and peer review process, describe some conventions of, of peer review articles, kind of how they're organized and what they look like, and then talk about some ways that, that you can engage with the annals. About me, um, I took up karate about a year ago, and this is me um, just passing my first belt test. I have another belt test this weekend, so I'm very excited about that. I moved to Utah in April 2019 from Chicago, Illinois. Um, here at the University of Utah, I direct the graduate programs in industrial hygiene. We offer master's and doctoral degrees. And I've been the chief editor since November 2021. Although this makes me concerned I have an older version of my slides, but we will carry on. Um, that since November, <laughs> Sorry, since November 20, um, beginning with volume 65, which is what we're currently publishing. My research is actually around exposure modeling, um, exposure measurement data analysis, and infectious disease transmission, including assessment of exposures to viral pathogens, uh, protection of healthcare workers, as well as quantitative microbial risk analyses. Under the leadership of the prior editor, chief editor, Noah Satius, the annals updated the scope of the journal and changed the name of the journal from the Annals of Occupational Hygiene to the Annals of Work Exposures and Health. And this was motivated in a large part because they wanted to um, recognize the broader variety of work exposures that are of concern today, including psychosocial stressor, as well as to expand the scope to include um, applied epidemiologic studies that could actually inform work practice. So we still publish and still interested in studies that quantify work exposures and aspects of work organization that give risk to such exposures. Um, and that can include psychosocial stressors. So this is chemical, biological agents, physical agents, um, and any kind of work exposure. We publish studies about the relationship between these exposures and health consequences, and that would include risk assessments as well as epidemiologic analyses. We publish articles that focus on populations at special risk of work-related exposures, um, whether they're at risk because of gender, race, ethnicity, <clears throat> socioeconomic status, um, any of those factors. That's something that we're particularly interested in. We publish studies about the effectiveness of interventions, and this can be from behavioral interventions to engineering controls or reorganization of workplaces. We um, do publish articles about policies and management approaches, although we don't get a whole lot of submissions in this area right now, but that's something that we are interested in. 
And then we uh, publish articles about methodologies and mechanisms that underlie the quantification and or control of exposures and risks. So this would be new sampling instruments or new control ventilation designs or other kinds of control strategies. We publish things that are both theoretical and applied research, including case studies and implementation research. Implementation research or implementation science is about how to implement policies or interventions in the workplace. And so we, we are interested in those kinds of studies. So traditionally, the annals is really focused on research involving quantitative methods, but qualitative methods are increasingly important in occupational health and occupational hygiene research, uh, particularly around issues of work equity and, uh, and or disparities in the workplace. And so we do publish and consider studies that utilize qualitative research methodologies. Kind of our goal though overall is to make sure that what is published in the annals is helping people with both research and practice. And so we, we ask the question of every submission, is this paper going to help readers better understand quantify and control conditions at work that adversely or positively affect health and well-being. Because we would like to distinguish the annals by making sure that the work that we publish can be used in practice to actually make changes. So that doesn't necessarily mean that every research is fully applied. We do consider theoretical work, but we want to be oriented to research that will change and improve how we uh, protect workers and create healthy work environments. We publish at the annals nine issues per year, unless we have a supplement. Uh, each issue contains about 130 pages, which is about 12 articles. And um, we're currently publishing volume 65 in 2021. Um, we actually have accepted all of the articles for volume 65 already because we've had a big surge in submissions, as I'll talk about in a minute. And so now uh, articles that we're accepting at this point are going to be published or assigned to issues in volume 66. As of 2021, the journal is now fully online. Uh, an advantage of this is that that means um, authors can include color photos at no additional charge, which uh, can enhance the experience for the reader and allow the authors to convey more complex data uh, graphically. And this is just some statistics about the journal over the last couple of years. As you can see in 2020, we had a large increase in the number of submissions from an average of 250, which had been consistent for the past uh, five to six years, to 343 submissions. Um, our rejection rate stays pretty steady at about 60%. And when we say we have 353 submissions and rejection rate of 59%, that means we review a lot of articles. So in 2020, we had 334 people perform reviews and we collected a total of 554 uh, reviews. Most articles are reviewed by more than one individual. Our journal impact factor is trending upward. So the journal impact factor is a pretty common metric of an overall uh, journal's performance or impact on readership and citations. So this factor is the number of, is calculated as the number of citations in the year 2019 of articles that were published in the previous two years. So there is a bit of a lag in that it's looking at articles that have been published in the last two years. It does not reflect cumulative citations. It's only for a small time window. Um, we're pretty happy with the journal impact factor. Our journal impact factor is slightly higher than our primary competitor journal, the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Hygiene, or JOEH, uh, and it has been uh, steady and, and trending slightly upward. Our goal is to try to move it to, uh, to be above two in the near future. As a, as a reader, this doesn't have a huge impact on your experience, but it's a metric that's important for authors because many people in academia are judged um, by the journal impact factor of the, or the impact factor of the journal for which they in which they publish their, their research. 
So the higher you can get that, the better off um, you are for your authors. We do publish special issues and we have a supplement under development now. Um, the supplement that's in process has actually been commissioned by the U.S. National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences to publish the exposure assessment work related to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which occurred several years ago in the Gulf of Mexico. We expect that that supplement will be complete in the next six months, um, and that we've been anxiously awaiting its completion. In development, there will be a call coming out very soon for a special issue that would be about the assessment of the longer term impacts of COVID-19 among workers, in which case we're looking more for larger studies and reviews about impacts on workers' health broadly defined, whether that be via economic disruption, um, direct burden from infection or mortality with because of occupationally acquire COVID-19, um, long COVID among workers, a variety of factors. Supplements are published as a supplement, and so that means we would have more than nine issues come out in a year. Um, and special issues are just one of the nine issues dedicated to a special topic. Uh, so in this year, we have had a special issue focused on a specific conference related to occupational and environmental exposure of the skin to chemicals, that was issue two. And last year's special issue was related to health and safety in the cannabis industry. If there's something that you are interested in seeing in terms of special issues or featured articles, um, you can get in contact with me because we're always interested in finding things that are highly topical and relevant to our readership. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the journal is organized and operated. Um, as the chief editor, my job is to have overall editorial and scientific responsibility for the content of the work, that we're um, publishing work that is of high scientific quality, and then I set the overall editorial direction for the types of articles that I want that, that are included in the, in the journal and making sure that everything aligns with the scope of the journal or that any deviations are planned. <laughs> um, I also do activities to promote the annals include it with the occupational hygiene community, such as this kind of event. Um, when an article is submitted, it's my task to screen that article to decide whether or not it's of sufficient quality and interest to move it forward to peer review or to um, immediately reject the article. I um, handle peer review process for articles that I edit, and I also assign other uh, articles to other editors to handle, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then whenever the assistant editors have reviewed, completed a peer review and made a decision, I review and approve their decisions. Roz Phillips, who many of you may know, is our editorial manager, and she really runs the day-to-day -day functions of the journal um, for all things other than editorial decisions. So she interfaces with our publisher, Oxford University Press, and their administration and production teams. She manages the Scholar One settings and operations. Scholar One is our um, manuscript management software. She responds to author queries and she keeps me on track. So we meet every week and review um, upcoming expectations and tasks that need to be completed. Every month or every, you know, nine times a year, for example, we have to put together an issue which requires the selection of the articles and the ordering of the articles for each issue. And Roz and I work on that together. We also would work together to, to select the cover photo for the cover of each issue of the journal, and then um, check and make sure that the cover pages and background information are correct. So Roz has a, a significant role in the success of the annals. And if you email the general annals email, which I'll show you later, Roz will be the person who receives that. We have an editorial board. The editorial board includes a group of assistant editors and several other people. And all of the assistant editors in the board have very specific domains of expertise in which they handle peer review of articles that are assigned to them in their area of expertise. 
The editorial board also provides input to me on annals, operations, and future directions, including editorial direct, you know, editorial ideas. And we meet about twice per year. Um, traditionally, the board has met every year at the BOHS conference, um, but we've been meeting virtually and that seems to be working pretty well. I do have intent to expand the board by several members in 2020. Um, we, I would like to do this for two reasons. One, there are certain domains in which we need additional expertise owing to the volume of submissions in these areas, including physical activity, ergonomics, and biomechanics. Our assistant editor in this area, Sven Eric Mathiasen, uh, left the board recently as part of his uh, phased retirement, so we're looking to replace him. We also have a, huge, a large uh, number of articles being submitted in the areas of exposure assessment for epidemiology and epidemiology studies. And so we need some additional expertise to handle those. As, and then the third major area is physical hazards. Um, we're also looking to increase uh, global representation of the board, in particular to add members um, from East Asia or South Asia, uh, South America or Africa, because as you'll see in a minute, we're, we're really dominated by members from uh, North America and Europe. We do have an international advisory board, which consists of 38 members, um, and we'll be revisiting the function of this board in 2021. They haven't been uh, particularly active as a group, and so we want to um, engage them uh, more in our operations. This list shows our assistant editors. Um, I can, I'll just talk, introduce each one briefly. Uh, Lisa Brousseau is retired. She was a faculty member at the University of Minnesota and actually my colleague at the University of Illinois at Chicago for many years. Um, she's now, she's an expert in personal protective equipment, particularly respirators. Uh, Wouter Franzman is from the Netherlands and works with TNO, and he uh, edits a lot of our articles around exposure assessment. He has a real depth and breadth of experience with a variety of hazards. Deborah Glass is our representative from Australia, from the University of Bonash, and she works in exposure assessment, particularly for epidemiologic studies. Kjeld Alstrup Jensen from Denmark is um, an expert in aerosol science, and he handles a lot of the articles on those topics. Kate Jones with the Health and Safety Laboratory in the UK um, is an expert on biomarkers, and she handles many of our articles on that topic, as well as a dermal exposure issues. And Opliger um, in Switzerland um, is our expert in bioaerosols. Susan Peters in Utrecht University is an epidemiologist and handles many articles in that area. Uh, Gurumurthy Ramachandran, who goes by Ram, is at uh, Johns Hopkins University and he does he handles general industrial hygiene articles as well as Bayesian statistics and other statistical methods. Uh, Sean Semple at the University of Sterling handles a wide variety of, of um, exposure assessment industrial hygiene articles. Vivi Schlissel. Schlinson, excuse me, is an expert on respiratory health effects and handles articles around respiratory exposures, health and risk assessment. Uh, Peter Smith at the University of Toronto in Canada um, works in the area of psychosocial stressors. And Peter Stacy at Health and Safety Laboratory um, handles a lot of articles about um, sampling methods and sensors as well as engineering controls. We have some additional editorial board members who don't handle review articles, but provide general direction and advice to me. Um, John Cherry, who probably many of you know at IOM, Marty Van Tongeren at the University of Manchester, and Roel Vermeulen at Utrecht University. The Annals has a global reach. Um, the figure on the right shows the readership from 2020 and the top 20 countries. And as you can see, it's probably not surprising it's dominated by readers from the United States owing to our relatively large population. Um, but we do have readers from around the world. We also have authors from around the world. We, 53% of our, of our corresponding authors in 2020 were from, you know, primary, predominantly English-speaking countries of North America, the UK, and 
Australia, New Zealand, um, 38% from Europe, probably a little more than half of those from uh, Scandinavian countries. And then we have also published articles last year uh, with authors from Chile, China, Iran, Malaysia, Nepal, Pakistan, and the Republic of South Korea, Republic of Korea or South Korea. Um, this is something that we're, we're working on making sure that there's a good balance in representation of, of authors from developing countries, um, in part because the work there can showcase kind of the stat status of development of occupational hygiene as a profession and practice in those countries. And some of the research topics are, are quite good and, and quite interesting. So it's exciting to, to see increased submissions from from uh, developing countries. We had a huge increase in full text downloads in 2020. As you can see on the chart here, it was associated with the onset of the COVID pandemic. Um, we had nearly 1.1 million downloads last year. <clears throat> but this is largely, I believe, driven by the COVID pandemic. The most downloaded article last year it's actually about 10 years old, and it's from a group with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in the U.S. And when you see the title, you immediately know why it was the most downloaded article, Simple Respiratory Protection, Evaluation of the Filtration Performance of Cloth Masks and Common Fabric Materials Against 20 to 1,000 nanometer sized Particles. And so that had the peak of 300,000 downloads in 2020. So COVID had... I think overall a good benefit for the annals. We had a surge in usage because min, much of the content in the annals is relevant to prevention of COVID-19 in the workplace. We had an increase in submissions overall last year, which was not entirely due to COVID, but we did have 18% of the 2020 submissions related to COVID. Uh, we offered expedited typesetting so that COVID-related articles could be um, put online more quickly or as quickly as possible. And now we're preparing to solicit content for a special issue that will kind of look back and look forward um, about the impacts of COVID on workers globally. We, courtesy of Oxford University Press, all COVID-related content has been free to all readers. And this is, can be accessed uh, through the web link here. Oxford University Press is the publisher of the Annals, and it's their mission to create the highest quality academic and educational resources and services and to make them available across the world. As a reader, you, you might not have any real interaction with Oxford University Press other than through the, the Annals website. Um, but as an author, you would interact with Oxford University Press through the Scholar One system. They also do a lot of marketing for the annals and monitor our performance, such as uh, downloads, for example, and citations. And they they report on the journal impact factors. And then you, when you do have a paper that is accepted, you will be in communication with Oxford University Press personnel with respect to licensing of the article typesetting production. I just want to draw your attention to something that the Oxford University Press does. They have this blog where they have uh, invite authors and editors from a wide range of disciplines, so from their journals as well as their books, and they they post blogs um, related to to current topics or areas in their discipline. They're pretty short, three to 500 words. And I, I find it very fascinating. So when I get a little bummed out at work and I need a little break, I like to go and check out um, the OUP blog. We publish at the Annals a variety of article types. So we'll just talk briefly about these. these. Um, editorials and commentaries are quite similar that they're supposed to be about uh, topics that are important to occupational hygiene. Editorials tend to be focused on the annals itself, and the authors are generally the chief editor or the assistant editor or other invited people. Commentaries are submitted by, by potential authors um, and discuss current issues. One of our most downloaded commentaries recently was actually about issues with COVID and requirements for respirators and impact on on the Sikh population of healthcare workers um, who, who for cultural and religious reasons maintain a beard. 
So commentaries are on a wide variety of topics. Uh, letters to the editor are quite short. Um, usually they're in response to another article, but you can write a letter um, about any topic. Um, these editorials, commentaries, letters to the editor are reviewed or undergo peer review at the discretion of the chief editor. Generally, I would review them and ask also one of the other assistant editors to review them as well. A review article is a formal critical review of existing evidence. So this would be like a systematic review or a scoping review where there is actually a methodology to the review. Original research articles are our bread and butter. So these are reports of scientific investigations. They tend to be uh, up to 5,000 words with six to seven tables and to report kind of a comprehensive um, research study. Research articles that are shorter in scope or smaller in scope, like a case study can be submitted as a short communication. Those are about 1,500 words. And so these are similar in structure to the original research articles, but just uh, more limited in scope. So what exactly does it mean to say that an original research article reports a scientific investigation? That means that the article identifies and addresses a knowledge gap or a challenge that's important to occupational hygiene. It will either have a formal hypothesis that is tested or pose a research question and answer that question. It employs robust scientific methods, um, and so that means that they're using either accepted methods or well-justified innovative methods um, that are reproducible, um, seek to minimize potential for bias, etc. And we want an article, an original research article, should mean that the findings can be generalized. And by that, in practice, what that means is that there's a sufficient sample size, whether that's because you sample a large number of workers at one site or because you study workers at multiple sites, um, that the information gained can be applied in other settings, right? So this is not, this would be bigger than a case study at one, one organizational site um, involving, you know, a sampling with, with 10 workers on one task, right? This would, this would be a larger in scope. If you're working on an article and you aren't sure if it fits under the scope of an original research article or a short communication, that's something that you can email and ask and send an abstract or a draft and I can look at it and give you some feedback. An original research article, short communication and a review all have the following organizational components. An abstract, which provides a short uh, overview of the article, a what's important statement, which is a new uh, component of our articles that started in issue three of this year. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Introductions, methods, results, discussion. Conclusion, which is kind of focused on taking the findings and interpreting them for this kind of generalized purpose and what they mean overall to occupational hygiene or the problem at that. At, at, at addressed, then acknowledgments and references. So the what's important statement is being used for marketing purposes, and it's really trying to hone in on what is the new contribution, the important contribution of the article. So it's not a statement of like what we did, you know, who we studied, but why the knowledge generated from this is actually important to workers and to occupational hygiene and how that information can be used. So more information about the components of the research articles and how to prepare them is available in our author guidelines. Uh, and the link is there at the bottom of the slide. So what does it mean to be an author? So there has been a history in publishing and academic publishing of just kind of putting, you know, senior people that you want to impress on your article or, you know, just, you know, just adding people because it makes them feel good or it benefits their career. Um, there's been a lot of pushback against this in academic publishing. And at the annals, we have the, the following criteria here um, for people who want to be included as an author. And when you submit your work, you're asked to actually attest that these things are true for each of the people listed as an author. So, for example, you have to contribute substantially to the conception or design of the work 
for acquisition analysis or interpretation of the data for the work. So that means you actually have to be involved in the collection of data, the planning of the study. The, the second point too means you actually were involved in the writing of the paper. So you can't just you know, collect data. You have to actually participate in the preparation of the manuscript. You have to have read the final version that's being submitted for publishing. And you have to agree to be accountable for the integrity of all aspects of the work. Uh, and this actually is it can be quite difficult and requires that the authors have a good um, data management uh, plan and process to make sure that all the authors have access to the data and are familiar with the analyses. So to actually make sure that your team meets these criteria requires some planning. Um, for example, it means you have to have everybody who you want to be an author see a draft of the work early on so that they can contribute to revising it for intellectual content. Um, and so, so these actually require some attention to make sure that all of the people you want to be an author are qualified to be an author. Other contributors should be acknowledged. When you submit articles, we use the Scholar One manuscript system, which is used by many, many different journals. Um, and you can see our link there. When you go to actually submit your article, you're asked to provide a certain number of certain files. One is the main text that would include the references with, and then figures and tables. Those can be uploaded as part of the main text or separately. The annals is actually not particularly picky about the formatting of the main text, um, as you would note in the author guidelines. Uh, so some journals are very particular. It has to be in a certain font with a certain spacing, certain text size. We're, we're not that, that particular. Um, we ask that you provide a cover letter, and in the cover letter, you specifically have to state that the article is not under consideration elsewhere. And that's where you would communicate to me as chief editor any other information that's pertinent. For example, if this is a, uh, has a companion paper that you want considered together, the two papers considered together. For, or if the, the first author is a PhD student, we do offer expedited uh, re peer review, and that should be noted in the cover letter. You're asked to provide an abstract and keywords, and then to complete the authorship and conflict of interest declaration. We also ask that you suggest reviewers. Um, that helps us. One of the greatest challenges of being an editor is finding um, qualified reviewers who are have the time and, and ability to complete the peer reviews. And if there is a person or persons that you don't want to review your article for whatever reason, you can uh, note that as well. And we will not uh, include those, invite those individuals to review. So after the article submitted, uh, as chief editor, I will screen it for fit with the scope, quality, conflict of interest. I'm supposed to do this within seven days. I usually am able to do that within seven days. Um, usually I can do this in the first day or two that it's submitted. After I screen it, I might immediately reject the paper. Sometimes I will provide comments back to the authors as to how they could improve the paper and may suggest that they re can resubmit it to the annals um, after a revision. Or I will assign the article to an editor for peer review. In the peer review process, the editor identifies and invites reviewers. And we identify reviewers in a number of ways, um, from our personal relationships within the scientific community, suggested reviewers, as well as um, we might search the literature to find other recent um, topic, other recent articles on the same topic and identify those authors. And then we also maintain a database of, of authors and reviewers from in the who've worked with the annals before, and we might search that. Reviewers are asked to complete their written review in 20 days. Um, this can be a challenge. Um, as an editor, not every reviewer um, is as mindful of deadlines as one would like them to be. And this is the process that can create delays in the the um, manuscript review process. Um, after the editor recommends a decision after re reviewing the written reviews and recommends a decision to the chief editor. And our goal is to be able to get this decision back within 60 days. 
at that point, I review the reviews and the decision, and I either approve the recommendation or suggest an alternative decision. And at this point, the article may be rejected, rejected and resubmitted. That is, we want this article to be successful in our journal, and we think it can be, but there's some sub substantial revisions that are required, like maybe some conceptual issues or the analysis um, should be done in a different way, would fall into the category of reject and resubmit. Major revision, minor revision, and then accept. Now, people's perceptions of major and minor revisions vary widely, um, but minor revision is usually like a few uh, typographical errors, some maybe awkward phrasing, uh, a table needs to be reorganized. A major revision usually addresses some methodological issue or some uh, interpretive uh, inference issue or interpretation of the data. Once articles are accepted, they go to editorial administration where a checklist is applied uh, um, to make sure that all the components are correct. And then the articles go to production where the authors review and correct the typeset proofs. Finished articles are then posted online immediately. And then I will assign them to an issue um, generally in the sequence in which they have been accepted with some variation for, for thematic um, representation and the issues. At the annals, we use a single blind reviewer, and that is the reviewers know who the authors are, but the authors don't know who the reviewers are. Blinding in, in review is uh, very controversial. There's a lot of debate about what is the right way to minimize bias. Some journals use a double blind review where the reviewers aren't told the names of the authors, nor do the authors know the reviewers. Although it's often possible to figure out who the authors are because authors usually cite themselves. And so they kind of out themselves in the manuscript. Um, some journals go to great length to mask that process. Others that use double blind review are less attentive to that issue. Some journals also use open review, which is actually kind of difficult as both an author and a reviewer. The, then because the reviews and the reviewer names are published on the internet after the article is accepted. And so um, as a reviewer, you have to be very attentive to, to what you write because it's going to become public. So the way that our reviews in the annals are done is that the reviewer is asked to rate the significance of research, the originality of research, the experimental design and quality of data. And they're asked to put it in the top 10%, top 25, top 50, lower 50, lower 25%, for example. Um, not every article has to be in the top 10 or top 25 percent on all of these things because we're looking for a wide variety we publish a wide variety of articles um, but we do like to see research that is original significant and of high quality then the reviewer is asked to write a recommendation to select a recommendation to the editor whether they think it's ready for acceptance requires revisions or recommend rejection then the reviewer can provide confidential comments to the editor. Not all reviewers do this. Usually this occurs when there's some particular concern by the editor that they want to reinforce to, to the editor um, to make sure that, that it comes through because the editor might or might not read the comments to the author, you know, as thoroughly as the reviewer would hope. So for things that they think are really important, they'll add a confidential comment. Um, then there'll be comments that go directly to the author, but are also seen by the editor. Generally reviews start out with a kind of a general impression statement. This might reiterate the overall objective of the manuscript or the study and whether or not that objective was achieved. Then they'll provide major comments, and these are comments that are substantive. For example, um, asking for further justification for a choice in a sampling method, or um, questions about the statistical analysis, or comments about the value of a figure, or um, a request for clarity about a table, or criticism of, of limitations. Right. So those are pretty major intellectual issues. Minor comments tend to be kind of language issues, phrasing, 
grammar kind of stuff or other smaller points. Um, it's helpful when reviewers kind of number these or <laughs> delineate them somehow. Some reviewers provide just a lengthy narrative, but most reviewers these days will kind of number out the comments and that's helpful to the author and the editor to uh, review and respond. So how do authors respond? Authors are expected to seriously consider the content of reviews. There's nothing more frustrating as an editor when the author says, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't care. I'm not changing anything. <laughs> that does not endear you to the editorial personnel. Um, you don't have to agree or implement all of the comments, but we would like you to seriously consider them and to prepare a written response to each comment from the reviewers and then revise the manuscript consistently. If reviewer comments are not appropriate, and there often are comments that are not appropriate or cannot be addressed or are outside the scope of what the manuscript is about, the authors can rebut the comment in the written response and explain why the comment is not appropriate. And this is something that I can help them with as well, because when I read the reviews, um, you know, I can I can help them to 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 determine which ones I think are more important or to support them in um, not responding to the reviewer. So one of my tasks as the chief editor is to to increase engagement with the annals, both by participating um, as the chief editor in BOHS activities, but also to try to increase readership and authorship submissions. So a couple of ways that we're trying to increase engagement is that I'm now, I have a, a short column in the Exposure magazine, which comes out six times a year, where I highlight um, articles and themes in upcoming issues of the annals. We also have the new what's important about this author statements that highlight the contributions of the articles to occupational hygiene. And these are used in social media and other things, but they are included in the articles. And then beyond reading the journal, um, consider submitting an article. Like I said, even if you're not a, a research scientist, we do accept commentaries. Um, we do accept short communications, which may include a case study or a exposure assessment at a work site, at a single work site. Um, and consider serving as a reviewer. So we're interested in training people to do reviews. Um, there are, is a special technique and skill about it, and we're going to work a little bit on that at the workshop that I'm hosting at the BOHS uh, conference later this month. And you can communicate with me about how the annals can better serve you in your profession. And so the annals at bohs.org goes to Roz Phillips, and Roz and I are in regular communication, so any inquiries that go to her will also come to me. Or you can always email me directly, and that's my uh, email here at the University of Utah. If you're unsure how to access articles, um, as a BOHS member, you do have the benefit of sub a subscription to the journal, and you can access uh, the journal through the membership portal at BOHS. You have to activate your subscription, and then you'll access the articles here through our website hosted by Oxford University Press. And here you will find the latest issues, um, other calls for special issues, and other um, advanced access articles are also available on this website. So I wanna thank you for, for participating today. Um, you know, it's the readers and the authors and the reviewers who really make the annals a success. And as chief editor, um, my job is to shepherd this process, but it's really important that our journal serve uh, our community and that uh, you derive as much value as possible from our efforts. So as I mentioned before, please, if you have comments or feedback or want to learn more about how to be an author or a reviewer, uh, please get in touch and I'm more than happy to talk with you about that. I will be hosting a workshop at the BOHS conference titled Annals of Work Exposures and Health, Breaking Down and Critiquing an Article. And in this um, workshop, we're going to look at an example article and talk about its structure and how to critique it, what to look for, what kinds of questions to ask. And so I hope that you can uh, join me at that time. 
Thank you. And I'll take any questions. Got a question here. So uh, does the annals consider studies based on qualitative data or mixed methods? Yes, we do. Um, so traditionally, we have mostly published quantitative research, but we now are expanding um, and looking for additional articles to, to consider that use mixed methods or qualitative research methods. So don't let the legacy deter you from submitting that kind of work. We are developing a kind of stable of reviewers that um, are, are competent in that area, and that is a particular interest of mine. Excellent, thank you for that question. There's nothing yet, so I, unless something interrupts and there is a question coming in, I'll perhaps say that um, thank you everyone if you're, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Rachel, for putting together the slideshow. And then anybody who is going to the conference, hopefully you can make it one to, to kind of part two of our, our annual series, essentially. So thank you for joining. Thank you, Rachel. And yeah, we'll speak soon. Thank you.